Commonwealth of Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it greatly. Uh, let me say that uh, yesterday the President signed an executive orders uh, related to energy. Uh, for my district, which has lost thousands of jobs in the war on coal, his declaration that the war on coal was over, and I say thousands of jobs, that would be direct and indirect, but he said the war on coal is over, and I'm glad to hear that. Unfortunately, in the past, uh, many people on the other side of the aisle uh, wanted to say there was no war on coal. They would always cite the price of natural gas, which is true, has been a, a market uh, problem for selling coal. But more important regulations, et cetera, have been a real problem for us. And I noted in uh, a political uh, a Politico argument on their site yesterday related to the President's executive orders that Brian Deese, former Obama energy advisor, noted that st stock prices for coal-related companies are down, underperforming the market by several percentage points, which he sees as a sign that the U.S. economy's transition to cleaner energy sources is firmly enough underway that this administration cannot fundamentally change that dynamic. And that, he argued, is partly because of the Obama team's efforts, not only on the regulatory side, but also with respect to research and commercialization, tax incentives, and otherwise. I think it's pretty clear there was a war on coal when the energy advisor can make those kind of comments after the fact. Now what we want to try to do is come up with a tax policy that makes sense, free market sense, let the, let the market determine where we should go. I believe in all of the above. I think there have been some great things with wind and solar, but we have to move forward. Now one of the interesting comments that came up earlier, and I understand there was a dust up when I was out meeting with constituents a little bit earlier, a dust up over uh, some of your comments, uh, Dr. Zyker, in regard to backup energy being necessary in the case of renewables. And I wondered if you wanted to, A, explain what kind of backups are necessary in relationship to renewables. Would that also apply to natural gas in certain times of the year or in crisis situations? And uh, uh, I understand that the study you're relying on, uh, its, its accuracy was impugned. If you'd like to respond to that, i would give you this opportunity. Well, I mean, there are two different questions there. One, uh, what are the backup requirements for uh, wind and solar power, you know, I wrote a book on this issue uh, or on, on the economics of renewables about five years ago, and my estimate of the cost of backup power given the um, capacity factor usage and the cycling of it was about $370 per megawatt. It was really quite quite striking. Uh, with respect to the, uh, the, pollution character, the pollution effects, of the uh, of renewables uh, combined with the need for their backup power that Mr. Clemmer and I uh, seem to disagree on. He's referring to a bunch of studies that, in effect, are looking at um, systems in which the market share of renewables is really rather low. It's it's when it's when renewables approach 10 percent or higher in terms of the market share that you start to get this uh, very very serious problem with cycling of the backup units up and down and uh, the increased pollution that uh, results from it. There's simply no question in the Bentec study of Colorado and Texas done about five or so years ago and other studies that once uh, renewable market shares reach about 10 percent, depending on local conditions, uh, the cycling prob problem results in, results in an increase in the emissions of uh, pollutants, uh, conventional pollutants in greenhouse gases rather than a reduction, which is not what the uh, clean energy proponents would have you believe. All right, I appreciate that. I also thought with some interest, because just something that I read about a number of years ago, that you mentioned that the Mojave Solar Project had not produced as much power. I'd like for you to touch on that, but also if you have any knowledge, at the time they were putting that in, there was a real environmental concern that they were going to destroy the uh, ecosystem under the crust of the desert. And if you have any information on that, I'd appreciate that as well. Well, there are no more deserts. There are only fragile deserts. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what fragile means, but any newspaper article, anything that talks about the desert, deserts are always described as fragile. Uh, the Ivanpah plant was supposed to produce uh, roughly a million megawatt hours a year, um, starting with its uh, operations about two years ago. It's only produced about 650,000 megawatts a year. Uh, a spokesman attributed that, and I, I'm not kidding, to sunlight conditions that were lower than they had been years of studies 
had suggested to them. That's what they claim, which is a little like the argument from, from Ghost Plan on Soviet agriculture. 70 years of bad harvest were created by 70 years of bad weather. That was essentially their argument. There actually is, uh, you, could, you could argue that there's a statistical distribution of sunlight conditions at any given site, and they just happened to get unlucky that the, the first couple of years they had more clouds than is normally the case. But if you wait enough years, everything will revert to the mean, and so they'll produce more power. Another th theory, which is, which is the one I think is m much more likely to be true, is that they overestimated um, uh, sunlight conditions at the site uh, in order to get the, uh, the Section 1703 DO, or Section 1705, I guess, DOE loan guarantee of 1.6 billion, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that plan is ever going to uh, operate as, as advertised. And with respect to your last question, what has happened to the, uh, the ground beneath the uh, heliostats, I, I don't know the answer to that. I've not seen. All right, I appreciate that. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen,